Hello, this is Krista with the lifeinprogress.ca. Um, here with my lovely guest today, fellow Canadian, <laughs> um, Heather Platt. We're going to be talking, actually, I didn't even write a proper title, but um, essentially we're going to be talking about the art of holding space, Heather's new book, but also the practice of holding space. Um, Heather is an author, facilitator, and teacher. Through the Holding Space program that she's developed, international retreats and workshops, organizational consulting, and her brand new book, The Art of Holding Space, um, a practice of love, liberation, and leadership, fabulous title, um, Heather guides and supports people as they learn the practice of holding space. She helps them deepen their relationships, expand their self-awareness, and recognize systemic issues at play. And I assume that means at play yeah, in our circles and then, you know, our smaller circles and broader circles. So a formal welcome, even though we chatted briefly behind the scenes. <laughs> Thank you. It's nice to be here. Um, I'm also delighted to share that Heather is willing to get do a, a book giveaway of a hard copy to any, so the winner, you can be anywhere in the world and that's not super common. Um, so I'm really excited about that. I think it's a, that'll be a beautiful um, gift to get into somebody's hands. Um, I did decide in, if you, so when you watch the interview, whether you save it and, you know, watch it in pieces or whatever, but at some point, if you would like to enter the giveaway, um, like the video, wherever you're watching, if you're on YouTube, Instagram, um, Facebook, and then you can share it if you think your circle, your community would be interested and open to it, but I'm not trying to force that. Um, but what I really want you to do is leave a key takeaway from our conversation, something that you learned, something that inspired you, challenged you, whatever it is, leave that in the comments in order to be entered in the giveaway. So Heather, um, I start all of my interviews this way, but I really love to get to know my guests a little bit better on a, on a slightly more personal level. And so I have a couple of questions um, that I'd love to ask you to get to know you better. Um, let's see. So the focus in my brave and beautiful community this month is journeying to freedom. So um, I would love to know how are you journeying to freedom in this season of life? What does that kind of look, sound, feel like? And then secondly, what's something that you are feeling hopeful or excited about these days? Mm. So I, I kind of feel like all of my work is about journeying to freedom. I feel like, that, and that's why I put liberation in the subtitle of my book, because I feel like everything that I've been um, doing is to try to help people find freedom in their relationships with other people and with themselves. And for me personally, it's, it's, it's an interesting season in my life right now. I have three grown daughters, but they're all still living at home. It's an odd time because some of them would have moved out there. Two of them are in university. One has graduated from university and they're all in the verge of moving out, but then pandemic kind of shut us all back, back down. So I'm in this kind of transition period between, you know, being a full nester and being an empty nester. And so I'm a little bit in that place of curiosity of what that will be. Um, what will come in in that season of my life with um, uh, my children leaving, you know, possibly within the year, all of them might might depart from my home. So that's mm. been, um, it's an interesting reflection. It doesn't cause me a lot of anxiety or anything. It's just a sit thing that I sit with with curiosity. And, and uh, so the freedom and and having built the business the way that I've built it, taking on a, a business partner, all of these things were to a certain degree allowing me freedom to do more travel, to do more um, exploring of new ideas, et cetera. Of course, the travel is limited right now, but um, there, yeah, I feel like I've built a lot of structures into my life so that I do have increasingly more and more freedom in my yeah. life. The second part of the question was what, I, what's, what am I looking forward to? What are you feeling so hopeful or excited about yeah, in this point. season? It's kind of heavy and hard. <laughs> Lots of ways. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it it is, and yet I I have to say that I I I don't I feel the heaviness sometimes, but it's not a day to day heaviness for me. It's I I can continue to do my work, and I love my work, and I feel really hopeful about the way that my work is growing. We've mm -hmm. just built the center for holding space in, in this past year, and there's just so much hopefulness around the community that that's coming into this work and. 
and I have this spaciousness now. I have more and more people that are teaching on my behalf. And so I have this wonderful spaciousness to, to do some new writing and new exploring mm -hmm. of ideas. And so that always gives me hope when I can be in a creative, energetic space. Mm -hmm. Is this the first year that you brought, like built a team? I've always had some version of a team. I've always had a couple of people supporting me in training in the training programs, but we've really evolved this year in terms of how the calls are hosted. They're hosting the calls and then I'm just kind of the visitor as the subject matter expert. Um, so I don't have to do the really intense holding the container for the courses, which is quite a, quite a remarkable change in terms of just freeing up my emotional energy uh, mm -hmm. and how that's supported. Hmm. Well, thank you. Um, I also wanted to just offer a genuine, heartfelt, like wholehearted um, congratulations for birthing this and bringing that into the world. Um, I had met with you a couple of years ago, I think, for a couple of coaching calls. And um, I think this was still just sort of a hope. You know, right. you hadn't found the right way. You know, I don't know exactly, but it, yeah. and, and here it is. Yeah. So congratulations. Um, and I, I would love it if you would talk to us a little bit about, um, well, because first of all, I'll just preface it by saying that I'm going to imagine or guess that doing this type of work is hard. There's emotional labor, there's physical labor. We're human. So there were probably an assortment of emotions that, you know, <laughs> yeah. grabbed your attention for a while. Um, so what did you learn as you were doing this work to bring this to life or wh what kind of lessons or learning or wisdom was deepened mm -hmm. as you did this? I, I'm on a personal level. I'm very curious, <laughs> but I'm guessing that some of, you know, the listeners will yeah. be yeah. interested as well. Oh, I, I feel like the easier question to answer was what, what, what didn't I learn? Because it's such an incredible process, writing a book and creating, I mean, we were simultaneously creating the Center for Holding Space. So this whole um, organization we're also building and it, it's intense work. And I feel like I kind of had to plunge the depths of my own self-esteem. I had to really dig into where are my places of self-doubt, what, what part of me is not prepared to be a leader in the world and to have this voice in the world, and how do I step out with what I believe to be really valuable work in, in a confident way that doesn't let my own kind of demons and blind spots get in the way. And and, and one of the biggest pieces of learning is who are the people that are meant to come around me and circle with me and do this work with me. And that's been a real evolution. Taking on a business partner has just been so wonderful to share that load. And I found really great people to help in the book publishing and a good editor and and, and we developed brand new websites and, and really solid relationships with good people who, who were keen to build this work with us. And so I keep coming back to community. Like this is the work that needs to grow in community and it needs to be supported by community. And it's about helping other people find community. So that's, that's some of the biggest learning is I, in order to teach other people community, I first had to really build and strengthen my own community. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Um, I probably shared on another video to my brave and beautiful community, but um, as I was preparing for our work around freedom this month, what I was noticing in myself was that this strong sense that I needed to loosen my grip and allow this very work to be rooted in freedom itself, you know, not just talk about freedom and not just sort of throw ideas at people, but like allow it to be a bit more unknown. Like, you know, let a little bit less structured, a little bit less, you know, prescriptive or, or whatever. And I find that so fascinating, <laughs> um, hard work and fascinating. And it sounds, it just reminds me so much of what you have said, like holding space really is about healthy community, essentially. Right? Yeah, it is. And it, it, it has to weave in the ideas of other people. It has to be. And one of the things that Krista and I kept saying as we were building the Center for Holding Space is that 
we're building the platform and we know and trust and believe that other people are going to come to build things on that platform. And so this is just creating some sturdy structure to hold space really for new ideas to emerge. So some people that are come, going to come through our program, for example, are going to take it in a whole new direction and learn, you know, and really deepen the work somewhere and other people in a different direction. And, and that's what energizes me is the what's the collaborative uh, work we can do what's the generative space we can create for for new ideas <coughs> to sprout so it, it it's even to be honest it's a little bit nerve-wracking to publish a book because to have something that's going to be in print and sitting on people's shelves possibly you know for 10 years or something it feels like you're putting you know a little bit of gospel truth out there or something and and i don't work that way i love to have evolving ideas i love to have i love to be in this space of emergence and new ideas continue to come so one of my um one of my teachers who works with me she she created this bowl and she had uh, like a velcro things that stuck onto the bowl and there were new ideas that she could stick onto the bowl it's related to the teaching and the in in the concept of holding space but I said, oh, that's so brilliant. And I kind of wish there was a Velcro place in my book so people could stick new ideas into it <laughs> as they emerge. So when my ideas generate your ideas, where can you stick them and add them to the to the growing work? Yeah. OK, so right here, then I'm going to pause and ask you about the journal, because I'm wondering maybe that has space where you invite people to kind of go off script a little bit and journal their own thoughts. So um, I want people to know, I do recommend this book. It's a, it's, it's, it's not sort of a quick read though. I think it's a book that will, is best um, gone through with some time and, and space to digest and ponder and, you know, um, think about your pr practical application and, and maybe even practice in relationships and stuff as you go. Um, and Heather has developed a journal that it, I think we can use as a guide, right, to go through. Yeah. So tell us about that, please. Yeah, so unfortunately, I don't have one sitting here in front of me. I should I should have one to ha use as a visual for these kinds of things. But um, we just got them from the printer just over a week ago. And it's it, what it is, it's, it's quite fat, actually. We, it's thicker when it actually arrived. It was thicker than I anticipated. But in a way, I like that because it's just really juicy and and it's it's meant to guide you through the the book or be your companion as you go through the book and so uh, we've designed it in such a way that at the beginning of the journal there's several pages where there's about four questions for each chapter and it just goes through all the chapters and all the questions that come along with just to help you reflect more as you're going through the book and then the the rest of the pages, I, I intentionally left the all the questions at the front so that you can journal as much as you need to on any yeah. question. There's not yeah. a limitation on that. And then sprinkled throughout the book, there's quotes from or throughout the journal, there's quotes from the book that you hopefully will inspire you further. And then we've also designed a card deck with 52 cards. And again, I don't have a visual here, but we can um uh, it's if on you your instagram to, page i think so anybody who's on instagram can go so and if you go to our center for holding space.com slash shop everything is in there you can order a journal and, and card deck and the book and we have a gift set with all three of them so really we're looking for what are the tools that people will need to do this kind of work because i want it to be deep i don't want it to be kind of a throwaway book that that you you know you read for a couple of days and then you toss it aside i really encourage people to take it deeper and and take it into book study circles and you know with your community yeah yeah it's um something that has helped me so i didn't add this to our talking points but um i think i found your blog post a few ish years ago um, that you wrote about when your mom was dying and sort of how you started thinking about, you know, um, this idea, which I think some, it originated, the idea of holding space originated elsewhere, right? But then you really, I think you helped popularize it for sure and then deepen the work and make it accessible for us. Um, and so it's been really helpful for me in my own work with clients, but just on a personal level, walking through crises, walking through loss. Um, and it's something that I know matters 
to my life and my work. So I want to take my time with it. And I want to really like, it's not, I don't feel like it's something that I, I'm just going to get through. It's something that I'm just going to keep carrying with me. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so that uh, like learning more and more as I go. And I wanted to share, I grabbed this from my book stack too, but it remi- it's so different, but it reminds me also of this book. I love it's, that book. Yeah. It's, and again, this is another one. It's like, this is not about quick fix or rush through weekend binge. Like this is about changing our hearts, changing, you know, healing bits of ourselves. And, you know, um, so that, but that's what it reminded me of. And I think these two are going to be, yeah, just important books for me in the next year. Yeah, I love that. And oh, it's, it's really quite an honor to be paired up with that book because that one's been really influential in me, for me in the last year or so too about really looking at our trauma and our generational trauma. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. There's such, so maybe people, you could get both of them <laughs> if, if you're looking for a self-love gift. Yeah. Um, so in... I think I had a spelling error in here, a word error in here. So I'm just going to do my best. Um, but you write by holding space, you create a container for liberation to occur in your life and in society. The art of holding space is an instrument for hope, transformation. That's the word I wasn't quite sure. Um, and positive change in our time of near constant transition as we yearn to emerge into a new story. Um, so First, Heather, I want to say, and I don't mean this on a fluffy way, because I, I, I'm not really a fluffy kind of person. <laughs> I feel like you're speaking my language, but in a, like my spirit or inner self, it like is yearning for, for deeper understanding. And I'm not there yet, but it's like you're speaking my language and it's calling me there. So yeah. I feel like that's pretty cool. And Uh, you know, I don't know how else to express it to you, but, um, but would you please explain what it means to hold space, like briefly, you know, holding space for others, holding space for ourselves, and also how or why is this practice of holding space integral to learning to walk in freedom? Mm -hmm. So the very term holding space, I think, needs to be one of those ideas that I said earlier that needs to keep emerging and, and evolving. And because I, uh, and uh, sometimes when I, I, I host retreats or workshops, I intentionally don't give the definition up front. Like I want the people to evolve their own definition throughout the workshop. I've had some people get rather frustrated with me because they want it <laughs> up front. They want that information. But really, <coughs> but for me, as I've worked with this term over many years now, it continues to grow and evolve and it has this kind of life of its own. And I mean, originally I defined it as the, as really what you do when you walk alongside another person without trying to change them or direct them or, you know, impose your own narrative onto their life or control or fix them. And it's, it, you do that by really checking in with your own ego, checking in with yourself and, um, being as present as you can fully present for them but I think the bigger definition is that holding space is really evolving into this language of of liberation this is the language that and I had to be kind of insistent with my publisher that I wanted that word in the subtitle (laughs) the publisher pushed back they weren't quite sure it worked for them but I said no I really want this to be language of when we hold space in relationships when we can walk alongside each other without trying to um, take over the other person's narrative or fix them, offer them advice or solutions, then we can actually be in sovereign relationships where we're treating each other with dignity and respect and we're not trying to colonize each other or control each other. And so that's the language that I want to keep working with and evolving around this Mm -hmm. is that let's take this bigger and 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 that's been some of my frustration some of this language of holding space it's been a bit of a throwaway term in the kind of new age spirituality or the wellness world and and people don't necessarily understand how deep it can be when you start talking about liberation and sovereignty and 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 you know that means treating marginalized people the same way that you treat yourself for example that means that there's when you're, you got to take this work really into uncomfortable places if you're really willing to do it well. 
Yeah. Do you think that it's, um, I'm so I am going off script and we'll come on back. Um, but thinking about this season of life and, um, and not just this season, but like all the, the stuff that's really at the forefront right now, uh, racial injustice, um, you know, in our own country, still the indigenous populations that don't have drinking, like just drinking water, like just, there's a lot of pain in the world. There's a lot of imbalance. There's a lot of work to be done. Um, and then like, you know, for me, like, um, advocating for mental health support. You know, my son died because of severe depression and suicidal ideation and walking through our Canadian systems of support, it was horrific. So, you know, there's a lot of work to be done. Um, if somebody is new to this, I'm, I'm curious, do you think that there is value in focusing on learning what it means to hold space for self first? before trying to become an ally or you know help a helper <laughs> of some sort yeah then ego yeah, so you, that come, comes along with us unaddressed right right exactly so if you hold space in a way that marginalizes yourself then you're not doing anybody any favors and that's what i see in a lot Enters of people. yourself or marginalizes yourself Sorry, what, what was the question? You, you said if you hold space in a way that marginalizes yourself. And I'm wondering if you meant centers yourself. Well, either. It's either oh, okay. or. So you can hold space in a way that centers yourself, that makes you more important than the other person. You yeah. can hold space in a way that marginalizes yourself and only puts the other person's needs uh, in, in the center. So now your needs have no relevance. And what, the, what we need instead is a balance between those where my needs have value, your needs have value. I'm not going to colonize myself by shutting down my needs in, in service to your needs, okay. but I'm also not going to colonize you by shutting down your needs in service to my needs. And that's really the, the, what I'm, I'm advocating for when I talk about this holding space with, as sovereign individuals is how do we meet each other in a way that does not destroy either you or, or I, does not do violence to either you or I. And you're right, the work really needs to start with what's going on for me. And when we try to control another person, it's usually an, a, an indicative of something that we're doing in ourselves. When we try to, when we show up to support another person and we feel a strong need to give them advice, that's some insecurity in ourself. And that, so we have to keep shining the mirror back to ourselves is what's going on in me that makes me not able to hold space for this person? How do I need to soothe myself first? How do I need to look after my nervous system if something is causing me to be triggered in this situation? How do I need to set up healthy boundaries so that I'm, I'm able to be fully present? Because that's the only way we can we can do it for the other person and, and expect them to hold themselves as well. And so when they start to cause us harm, then we have, uh, then being a sovereign individual, we can pull ourselves out of that situation. Yeah. So, I mean, I, this is a lifelong thing, right? Um, and we're going to get it wrong sometimes and we're going to keep learning and practicing. Um, but do you recommend, like, if somebody really wants to learn, say, how to be a better ally or or a better advocate for a marginalized community or whatever you know do you recommend that they do a bit of work on themselves like literally like get a course get a book something like that work with somebody before entering the fray absolutely absolutely because we do damage uh, um, and wounded people will wound other people and so if I go into a place thinking I'm going to help them, if I go in and thinking I'm going to serve marginalized people, but I haven't looked at my own biases or blind spots or pain points, and I don't know what's going to trigger me, then I'll go there and they're, they very well might get reactive because they're going to see, for example, a white savior walking in the room, they might get reactive. Well, that's going to cause a great deal of defensiveness in me because I'm not prepared to hold their reaction. I can't hold space for really what's going on in the room. So that's where our, our personal work is really critical, understanding our, you know, uh, where our blind spots are, understanding where our privilege is, all those things are important work to do. 
So just as you were um, sharing that, a couple other Canadian people, their, um, their names popped into my brain and I want to share them to people because I, I think they might be good resources also for people who want to do this work. So um, Jake Ernst in Toronto, psychotherapist, I think, um, specializing in mental health support for young people. Um, he created something called the Roots of Safety model. And it can be super helpful because it's about helping ourselves. Um, like, I think you might be familiar. I'm not sure if you are familiar, but just letting people know. Okay, um, the Roots of Safety model helps us notice um, our own nervous system and like what we need, how do we move into safety? Mm -hmm. And so that can be super helpful in becoming more body aware, emotionally literate, et cetera, which is so important to Absolutely. work. And then um, I was just checking, I wanna make sure I said her name right, but I think it's Lisa Renee Hall. I think she's in Toronto area as well. Um, and she's an anti-bias facilitator and she has some free journaling prompts to help us for white people to start um, tuning in, noticing our implicit bias. Um, she offers some other, like some programs and things that, so I just feel like they might be like nice sort of, um, um, people doing great work that would also, you know, help anybody interested in this, in learning the practice of holding space. <laughs> so. Yeah, I know Lisa's name. I don't know the other name, but yeah, absolutely. Look for, there's lots of resources out there that are supportive. And I always encourage um, uh, people to look, especially for the marginalized voices. Like I, I, you know, read my book alongside somebody who's teaching this work from a, the perspective of a, a Indigenous person or a person of color. Don't just read the white voices out there because that's going to be a limited perspective, and and you need you need you need the the much more broad perspective. Yes, and and for um like for uh, other people, Jake is a young white man, um, and Lisa is a black woman, and so um. And I am curious, and then I'm going to come back to our talking points. Um, do you know of um, a Canadian or Indigenous educator, like specifically Indigenous, so I guess Canadian or North American, who is doing work in this area, like, um, well, what area? I think helping, helping people learn to, um, like, so not for coaches, but maybe like anti-bias work or... Um, that kind of self-examination type work. Do you know of an Indigenous educator or um, writer doing this? Yeah, I'm, I, I know of some largely in the U.S. I'm trying to think of somebody in Canada that comes to mind, and I, I would have to give it some thought because I, okay. I'm, I, uh, yeah, I'm, I can't, nobody's coming to mind right yeah. off the top. Of my okay, because I haven't found it, like I found some great authors, you know, yeah. and and but I would love to know like a few more resources for myself and um yeah okay back I on know track. That, I, I know that if people are looking into like um therapeutic methods this is a little different I'm not sure this is relevant actually but there's a woman named Shirley Turcott who teaches um indigenous therapy practices and uh, but I don't know that it would necessarily be relevant for people examining their own biases and things. So I don't know her work that well. Um, okay. That's one, one name that comes to mind. Okay, thanks. Um, so in an email that you sent out in September, um, it was you were talking about how people are co-opting the term holding space. I think what you mean by that is they're using it in ways that isn't aren't quite like accurate. Right. And, and specifically, um, you in that newsletter, you wrote holding space is not about being neutral in situations of injustice. It's about wise discernment, courage, boundaries, anti oppression, intersectionality and fierce love. It is about centering the most marginalized and keeping the oppressor out of the circle unless they show evidence of change and a commitment to repair. And you went on, but I had to like shorten it. Um, so so we're here holding space is not then about just like anything goes. It's not just about being here and, you know, being um, trying to think of a mindfulness term, but my brain went blank, but sort of just like, oh, it's all, it's all okay. Or something like that. It's like, no, it's not, <laughs> it's not all okay. Um, so would you 
share a couple of concrete examples of what it could look or sound like to do, you know, the the other, like to do the, um, let's see, to truly hold space versus to decenter the voice of the marginalized person or community. That'll be helpful, I think, concrete. Sure. Example. So yeah, this this is a this is a concern that I have, uh, and it's related to what we see a lot of right now in the world, and that is things like spiritual bypassing, where people want to be in this love and light and all, you know, we just think happy thoughts kind of thing. And I'm oversimplifying it, obviously, but, but that has some real um, shadow sides to it that has that that can really silence people that come with some dissent or come with some pain. Uh, and, and so we end up not being able to have really good deep conversations. And there's a chapter in my book uh, called From Safe Space to Brave Space, how I really encourage people to not just try to hold safe space, because when we hold safe space, what often what we're talking about is I want to stay in comfort. And if I stay in comfort, I'm not going to learn and grow and I'm not going to be able to accept any challenges. People are going to challenge me and I'm going to, you know, shut down in that. So what I really encourage people to do is explore how do we move into brave space so that maybe there's some biases I need to take a look at in myself. Maybe I'm harming people in this group because I'm, I, you know, I have some, some prejudice that's being revealed right now. And just one simple little example of that is, um, because I early in my work as a coach and facilitator, I thought it was my job to create safe space. And then I started to realize what's safe for one person may not be safe for another person. So if a person is a white privileged person who's always had some safety in the world, if they're demanding safety in the group, well, that might not be safe for the person with a disability or a person of color, indigenous person. And so one example of that, I used to teach some writing classes, and these were very personal writing classes where you were really exploring your own story. And um, one woman in the group was really exploring her own sexuality. And, and, uh, and so she was writing some stories related to her sexuality as a same sex and, and same sex relationships and some love stories kind of about same sex relationships. And she would read them out loud in class. There was another woman who emailed me after class one day and said, I don't feel safe in that class because I'm not comfortable with those stories being read. And I thought, isn't that interesting? Because what's safe for, because here I was creating a safe space where someone could explore their sexuality. It's not safe for the person with a more conservative religious view. So whose safety am I now going to put at the center? Am I going to make it safe for the religious woman and then tell the other woman she can't read her stories and that's where I had to choose one and you know and it, it's it's a tough thing to choose because you know you're gonna offend somebody but I cho chose I wasn't going to silence the woman who was a, you know a lesbian and had not had a lot of safety in the world and I chose instead to email back this woman and say I'm not going to silence her. And if that makes you uncomfortable, then you can choose not to come to the class. Mm -hmm. And she didn't return to the class. So that's, that's an example of where if we're just going to say, oh, let's make it safe for everybody. In the end, it may not be safe for anybody. Yeah. Wow. Hmm. Yeah, I like the, um, I like the idea of bravery because I feel like bravery is tangled up with fear, with uncertainty, with discomfort. Um, because bravery is when we come face to face, I think, or we learn to sit with, right? And we don't give up. We keep growing. We keep saying yes to life. We keep moving. Um, so I really do appreciate that. Um, and I don't say that lightly, like even naming my membership community Brave and Beautiful. Um, not that long ago, I would never, never be able to claim that ever. It's like, a journey to get there. It really is. And that's why I say from safe to space to brave space, because I think there has to be some some growth for that to happen. And I think there has to be some also some grace for those people who are still in a place that needs some safety you know that's okay that's part of your growth journey and i'm not going to judge you for needing that but if you're once you're ready to move into brave space then let's let's go deeper okay i really love the way you said that so you're not saying that this is wrong to desire 
safe space, but not every group is meant for that. Right. And they're just different. They're just yeah. different. And yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, and, and even within one group, like I find when I'm f facilitating a, a retreat, there's a little bit of movement back and forth. Like sometimes, especially at the beginning, we, we have to have some safety, especially for anybody who's had trauma. You come into a room, you're forced to, to do something brave. And I've made that mistake a few times when I've pushed people a little too hard early in the retreat. And you can see the body reaction in people yeah. that they're just not ready for it. So you do have to create work to create some safety so that you can invite people into the bravery. And right. same with, you know, in, in a longer term, when you look at our lives, like if there's been trauma, if there's been th things that genuinely make the world feel unsafe for us, yeah. well, we need to work through that and, and find our way once we're ready to step into a more brave space so no I don't, I don't ever force people or or judge people it's more of an invitation I try really hard to make all of my language invitational it's like uh -huh. yes you do to really grow you need to evolve to to be more ready for brave space but it's not if people are pushed into that then they're just going to uh -huh. shut down yes yeah, absolutely. And it reminds me even of my own work through trauma, right? Now, you know, in the past year or two, um, it's like safety is so important, but I get to regain a sense of agency by doing hard things. Like I want to keep showing up, but I'm choosing when. I'm not always choosing. My body sometimes goes into panic and all of that, in which case I feel like that isn't my choice. But, um, but I say that sense of safety doesn't mean I hide in a bubble, but it does mean that sense that I get to choose. I get to listen to this body. I get to notice when I need to retreat. I get to notice who I allow into my inner circle. Um, I get to, to notice if a therapist even feels trauma informed, like, and they're, you know, um, or yeah, you're right. Like then we just get super hyper we go into hyper arousal maybe, or, and, and we're so that we won't be able to participate or hear anything that's being said anyway. So, yeah. Um, Heather, I feel like I read in your book, um, where you, it may, it may not have been in your book, but I think it was, um, where you talked about though that holding space, the, the practice of holding space for each other can actually, I don't think you said it helps regulate our nervous system, but it was something like that. Like, I think that that creates felt safety, right? Absolutely. So that we can then explore other. Yeah. So, so yeah. it's not like we wait and for all for to feel 100% safe in the world before we do this work. It's like also in this work, we offer this gift to each other or the facilitator offers it, right? Right. Yeah. I, I, some of my learning I take from attachment theory and attachment theory has within it um, teachings around co-regulation, how we, uh, we develop attachment systems. And then, w you know, if we have healthy attachment systems, we can help each other co-regulate. So if I'm, and I try to do that even as a facilitator at retreats, if I can see somebody becoming activated in the room, and I, you know, I have a fairly good intuitive sense of when that's happening because I've witnessed it quite a lot in my in my life, my immediate family, and myself, etc. And and so if I see that happening, I will usually try to check in with that person, and I may ask them, would you would you value a hug, or is it, you know some physical touch might help to bring somebody into a more regulated place? Or I've had some one situation I write about this in the book where a woman went went into fairly extreme um overwhelm and a bit of a, a breakdown emotional breakdown in the room and i just went and i knelt at her feet and i said can i hold your feet to the floor and it was just you know and she just wept and wept and the other co-facilitator came around behind her and put a blanket over her shoulders and the whole group just really held space for her to have this melt it was a really moving moment mm -hmm. and we just helped kind of ground her and hold her and without invading her space and being really respectful and it helped to just bring her to a place where and she had such a um, moving experience of that of being held and not judged while she was having this emotional moment and 
Mm. She told me later she'd never been in a space that made her feel more safe and that she could do more brave work because she felt that contained her. So yeah, it's such a, I mean, it's a, it's really holding people in this complexity of, of that movement, the safe, brave, and we never know when somebody's going to have that kind of uh, nervous system overwhelm. And, and as people who hold space, we have to be prepared to, to honor that and, and be supportive of it and, and help the person in, into healing and growth. Yeah. Hmm. Um, well, okay, I'm gonna, so my last question, I'm gonna thank my friend Zena for sending me this um, article by Richard Rohr. Um, and in it, he um, wrote about revolutionary love and said that revolutionary love is the choice to enter into wonder and labor for others for our opponents and for ourselves in order to transform the world around us. It is not a formal code or prescription, but an orientation to life that is personal and political and rooted in joy. I have to underline, I love that. <laughs> um, loving only ourselves is escapism, he writes. Loving only our opponents is self-loathing. Loving only others is ineffective. All three practices together make love revolutionary and revolutionary love can only be practiced in community. Mm -hmm. um, what are your thoughts on this? Mm -hmm. And would you speak to the challenge of navigating the idea? I'm coming back to this idea for those of us who really you know, want to help build a kinder, safer world. And also we need to love ourselves we we need to be allowed to tend to ourselves and not fall apart etc so navigating this tension is not always easy I feel I feel conflicted regularly about um so but yeah so this this quote by Richard Rohr would you just speak to that whatever kind of comes up for you and then we'll kind of flow from there sure so I I I love Richard Rohr. I'll start by saying that, that he's been one of my inspirations. And, and I feel like that, that quote could have been in the foreword to my book, because it really speaks to a lot of what I, I teach. And, and um, yes, I think that this is, that's why, I mean, I mentioned why liberation was in the title of my book, but also love is in the title of the book, because it is about a, it is about a, a fierce, hard love. And when I say hard, I don't mean it always has to be hard, but it, it, can, it can be challenging. It stretches us. It makes us have to do things that might be uncomfortable. It's not the easy, you know, um, flowers and apple pie kind of, kind of love. It's Although pie is always welcome, just saying. Okay. Anybody want to make flowers or apple pie? <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's showing up and doing hard work together and to be in loving spaces. And one of the metaphors that I use, the, so the book, book's broken down into three sections. The first section is holding space for others. The second section is really holding space for yourself, although there's, there's lots of blending between those. And then the third section is really some of the complexity of holding space and power imbalance and when there's privilege and intersectionality, all those issues. But the second section, I talk about holding space for yourself, but the metaphor that I use to help people understand how to hold space for yourself, I talk about our psychic membranes. And I, I really love the metaphor of the, of the cell. Every, we have millions, I think billions of cells within us. And if you look closely at the cell, it's just such a perfect metaphor for holding, holding space for ourselves well, because the cell has this beautiful in probably transparent I've never actually physically seen one but a membrane that lets in what you need to nourishes you that knows to keep things out that are not healthy and the cell membrane also knows how to link up with other cells that it's meant to be with and so the cell like our muscle cells don't connect to brain cells because they repel each other whereas a muscle cell is going to connect to another muscle cell so our cells teach us how to be in community they they hold themselves and contain themselves and protect themselves nourish them, themselves they let the energy and they have a mitochondria which is a place where they store up the energy and they interact with other cells that they're meant to be with in community to to build our muscles to build our brains and um 
you know, they maintain their, their homeostasis. There's a balance between their inner world and their outer world. Mm -hmm. And I think this is what teaches us how to be in relation with community. One thing it teaches us is we're not meant to be in community with everybody. We're mm -hmm. meant for our select community and, and we should revel in that and love our people and do our work together, you know, with passion and love and accept the fact that some people are not meant to be our people and they can they can link up with their own people over in, in somewhere else but it's so that's where i start with that work is how do we understand ourselves in relation to other people we're we're not in, in our north american culture becomes it has become quite fiercely individualistic and and i think that that's that's a falsehood we need to let go of i think we need to look at what are we meant for in relationship and community and what can we together do together and right now during a pandemic is a great example we're having to make some sacrifices and stay home and put on masks and it's largely to protect our community members and the most vulnerable in our community and how can we show up to do that even though it may cause us some distress mm -hmm. yeah um one of the things that i so i'm a very strong introvert um and i don't haven't always felt like i fit well i'm kind of socially awkward like i don't um and but i have i worked my butt off to build beautiful, beautiful friendships with wise women around the world. <laughs> um, but this season, you know, I was in a serious car accident three weeks later, my son died and pandemic and all of these things. I have, you know, like never before have I witnessed the beauty and the gift and the necessity of local community also, not just local, but also local. Um, and I've been hearing from some women that I'm working with that the pandemic has brought to the forefront again their need and desire to connect into local community as well. I find that interesting because um, I think online world is a beautiful gift for so, so many of us. And it's not a replacement for, right, right connecting in. Um, um, and that, that can be challenging. And I know for me, for years, it was easier for me to not try too hard locally, like, um, because, you know, anyway, but it ju that just brought it up, uh, this, the need for community, we need each other, not only do we co regulate, but like, we need each other on so many levels. And, um, and it's a beautiful thing when we yeah. And it can be a scary thing. I guess my point is, I think that, you know, that even though it's hard, sometimes, it's worth it. It's worth it to continue to forge these relations. Well, and that's, I, I, I say it's rather indicative of our culture. If you go to a bookstore and there's a large section on, uh, on self-care and self-help, and there is no section on community care or community help. Like, where do you find a book that teaches you how to be in community? And uh, like, you don't even know where to start looking. And I've done it. I've experimented in a few different bookstores. Like, Okay, where do I find that? There's some books in leadership, maybe. There's some, you know, if you're a religious person, there might be some church-related books. But there's there's no section that's even my book. I don't know, like it doesn't really have a place to belong on a typical bookstore shelf because we haven't learned how to talk about that in our culture. We're mm. very focused on on our on some personal development, and that's good. We need that, but that needs to evolve. That uh, that's a fairly culturally immature place to be. Is stuck in that place of self just self-help mm. on that note thank you so much for your time um what do you have a final word of encouragement or direction for people who want to learn more about this idea of holding space and where can they where, what's your favorite place for people to come and connect with you yeah I am you know, start where you are and what, what what you're able to handle right now start by like pick up the book if that's supportive to you but I also have lots of writing I have two websites right now actually heatherplett.com centerforholdingspace.com that's where we're really evolving this container to teach more programs and evolve more um, more resources and so check those both out if you want to buy the book or the deck of cards or the journal um, go to centerforholdingspace.com slash shop. And I, I, 
social media wise, I tend to spend the most time on Facebook. I'm also on Instagram, but most places you can find me as Heather Platt. And we also have a Center for Holding Space um, social media platform as well, although we haven't evolved that a lot yet, but you can find me. I'm lots of places. <laughs> okay. So your final word was start where you are. Yeah, I would, I would say it, it, be gracious to yourself and, and start with what's right in front of you. And, uh, you know, you, you, you're not going to solve all of your problems right now and you're not going to solve your relationships right now. But if you give yourself one, um, kind kindness today extends, I love, um, Christopher Germer, I think his name is, uh, the, um, uh, mindful path to self-compassion i think it's called it's a great book i highly recommend it and he talks about extending uncommon kindness to ourselves and so i'd say start with uncommon kindness to yourself and extending that to yourself helps you to extend it to other people as well yeah i love it thanks heather and just a reminder this is what her new book looks like and if you want to be entered to, into a giveaway for a hard copy of this book, wherever you are in the world, um, leave a comment. Wherever you're watching, leave a comment and share a key takeaway from our conversation. Um, and that'll end, I think, on the 27th, the Friday, last Friday of the month. I'm going to let it run a little bit, till 10 days or so. Yeah, thanks so much, Heather. You're welcome. It was a pleasure.